method. Uh, it will be available to NIMSA members on the uh, on the member site. Uh, we will not release any of the any portion of these recordings on the uh, on social media. So uh, just keep that in mind. Yesterday we had uh, we had two great speakers, um, <clears throat> and it, and it, uh, Don and me, the first speaker, uh, Admiral Mauger from the U.S. Coast Guard, and the second speaker, Rachel Slade, the uh, the um, author of the book Into the Raging Sea about the sinking of the El Faro. Uh, the, the, both both really uh, really interesting. <clears throat> presentations and um, I was I was uh, struck by the the inner connectivity of 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 the two in a way that uh, what, what struck me was was the um, the Admiral was talking about uh, the the resources and the and the support they have to provide for for some of these uh, these natural disasters that are happening that seem to be exasperated by um, by uh, climate change, global warming, stronger storms, uh, more uh, more violent storms that are happening in the future, and that they're um, the effect it has on those coastal areas that the Coast Guard is uh, is tasked with um, supporting and protecting. Uh, it's an even bigger impact to them, and how interesting that that connected with the storm that took down the El Faro, although there were a number of reasons for that accident or that incident, um, it's interesting that that the the storm staying and, and uh, staying in one location for a long time uh, uh, did so much devastation to the area and something something really to keep in mind the 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 um, the devastation of those uh, of that increasing violence of weather. So I thought that was interesting to me, and and uh, and I, I think we can all agree that 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 story of of Rachel's was gripping, and um, and we really uh, we really feel for that for the uh, family of those crew crew members who died. Um, and so it segues a lot into what we're we have speakers today who are going to uh, speak to us about um, about driving to zero emissions in our workplace. And I think this kind of ties in well with what we were talking about yesterday. That you know whatever part uh, our workplace uh, the emissions and and uh, environmental impact of our workplaces has uh, on it, um, they're going to give us some good uh, good information on how to how to reach that and how to improve. Uh, improve our workplaces. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, Giselle Aldrett and uh, and um, Renee Moylanen, Mo and then um, and then uh, the speaker later will be talking about OSHA uh, OSHA impact under the new Biden administration. So um, uh, I I agree that uh, that you know she's going to. Let us know and give in a little forecast on uh, whether it's going to be choppy seas or or, fa or fair sailing, uh, regulatory speaking, and um, and we look forward to to hearing that. So, um, moving on, we're going to start out. We have a presentation from one of our great uh, sponsors, World Crane Services (WCS). We have a um, we have a 16 minute video outlining what WCS does and um, and this equipment that they're providing to our workplaces are going to save lives and uh, and their commitment to safety and their commitment to NIMSA has been uh, has been invaluable. So uh, we'll we'll watch this uh, quickly and and you'll um, if you haven't seen this equipment before, I think you'll be really impressed with their uh, with their designs and capabilities.
Uh-oh. I see Hi. your video. Yeah, Difficult. Video stopped on my side. Yeah. I'm gonna take a moment to. I'm gonna take a moment to. Okay, let me uh let me fill in here while while we're going through that. Um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, the questions are welcome by all speakers. Uh, and make sure you use the chat box, which it looks like people are doing this this whole time. Um, if uh if you need to speak. Uh, and uh, make sure that you have your video on and you introduce yourself uh, before uh, when you begin to speak. And um, um, there's so many people on the call. Uh, our computers will run more efficiently if everyone turns their video off if not speaking. And everyone will be, will be muted by the host. So if we hear some background noise, um, everyone will be muted. So just keep an eye on your mute button. And... Um, and we can uh, make this go a little more smoothly. All right, everyone, just bear with us a few more moments. It's getting pulled up now. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Victoria. Victoria, are you hearing the sound? I see the video, but no sound. No sound on my end. Uh, let me try one more thing. Let's see. You know, these are the difficulties that we cannot plan. These that we cannot plan. <laughs> um, I, Heather showed that she was, um, if they were running off Heather's computer, it shows that she was um, muted. So maybe that has something to do with it. Platform while it's being positioned. While it's being positioned. Okay, I think I have a resolution. Still can't hear anything, Heather. I think Rob's right. Heather has to come off mute. Yeah, the volume was there for a second. Okay, I'm going to play it one more time. <laughs> Thank you. 
high-risk areas in the port operations where a lot of accidents have occurred over the years and this is of course um, what has unfortunately happened to personnel taking part in lashing operations uh, putting on or removing lashing from containers on ships so we aim to address that with our range of safety lashing cages as with all our products it's coming with design and quality that you can trust um, cages have undergone a rigorous design process and they've been continuously fine-tuned over the years. There's FEA analysis carried out by our design engineers, um, structural mechanical design, which is compliant worldwide with all international design codes and standards. We have a certified fabrication process. All cages undergo 150% load testing. There's third-party non-destructive testing and certificates provided. And of course, the cages are all finished with marine spec paint systems same as the rest of your board equipment to ensure a long life for the product. So all the cages that we produce have the following features and more, just to touch on it briefly. Um, all the cages have self-closing, self-locking doors, secondary attachments to protect in the event of a twist lock failure. So that's the cage. Safety lines at anchor points, which are rated, safety rated, and they're running the length of the cage for the workers to attach their harnesses. Uh, we have suitable storage units inside the cages for safe storage, twist locks, tools, lashing poles, etc. So, and much more. So there's more, I'll, I'll send on tech sheets to whoever's interested and you can have a look more in depth uh, on the general features of these cages. So I touched on the different models of lashing cage. This one, the 2040 foot modular cage is by far our most popular unit. Uh, basically what it means is that you get three different types of modes of operation in the one cage you get a full 40 foot unit you get a 20 foot unit in the middle which is removable which you can see here uh, in the center picture and that takes it out to operate as a, as a single 20 foot you can also lift with the 20 foot spreader from the center section here which i'll explain more about to get an extra added over height feature which we call 40 foot inverted gondola mode uh, just to mention We've supplied over 350 units of this type of cage worldwide. It's been a very popular product for us and it's been continuously fine-tuned um, as we supplied more and more within the industry. And since our last NIMSA meeting, there has been over 30 units of this particular cage supplied to ports in the US. So it's starting to gain a lot of traction in the US and the feedback is overwhelmingly positive from the unions and from the terminals that are ordering these. And just to name a few, we've worked with Charles and Steve Adoring Company, Georgia Ports Authority, Total Terminals, Houston Terminals, Husky Terminals, um, Phoenix Marine Services, APMT, and we also have supplied and are in the process of supplying the SSA terminals. So we're very, very happy with how it's been received in the US, and we're looking forward to, to develop, developing this more as we move forward. Just to quickly touch on this, uh, it's the feature I mentioned whereby you remove the 20 foot section and you lift from the center with the 20 foot spreader. Uh, so you're getting an extra container row of height with this option. And it's very popular for terminals that are dealing with increasingly large ships and who are limited in their lifting height with the, the STS equipment. Um, there's a video coming up that'll explain it a little bit more, but that is another mode of operation that is there present in the 2040 foot monitor unit or alternatively, it can also be purchased as a standalone 40 foot inverted gondola cage. Now we'll take a quick look at the latching safety cages in action. Introducing the WCS safety lashing cage, three modes of operation in a single cage. 40 foot inverted gondola mode. This mode of operation functions as an inverted gondola 
meaning that you retain the harm's advantage of a traditional gondola type rational gauge without putting your personnel at risk by placing them between the container stands. This is ideal for cranes dealing with very large ships with high deck stoves and offers a unique lifting height advantage. 24 hours modular mode. Eh, ah, ¿vas a hacer café ahora? Oh, sí, sí, sí. Oh, ok, sí, vámonos ahí. Vamos a una taza. Ok, está bien. Okay, right. 24 hours. Sturdy construction and industry leading features, the WCS safety matching gauge is designed to and compliant with all international design codes and standards. Load testing and third party non destructive testing is carried out on each cage produced. So that about wraps it up. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and listening. I hope everyone is enjoying the virtual NIMSA conference this year. It's a great honor for us to be involved yet again. As this was pre-recorded, I'm not able to answer any questions, obviously. So please, if you do have any interest or any questions on what you've just seen, get in touch with me. Um, take down my email address, my number, my mobile number here, which is also on WhatsApp. Get in touch at any time and I'm always available to give more information, answer any questions, and I'll be very happy to hear from you. So enjoy the rest of the conference and hope to see you guys all soon in the next in-person NIMSA meeting. Take care. Excellent. Thanks for pulling that together. Uh, <clears throat> the. Uh, the old vessel superintendent in me was uh, was taking downtime on that. It was only about five minutes, so I think we're good. Um, yeah, uh, that I think that equipment is really uh, really a game changer. We're we're late to the game on it. A lot of other employers have used it, but um, but uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, good uh, good feedback from from the uh, units we have and. Uh, employees really love it and they're asking for it. So I think it should be a, a good addition. OK, well, we're going to move on to our first uh, speakers of the day. I think we have a bio we're going to put up. I know you got to pivot there because of the uh, video, so um, please join me in, uh, in welcoming Giselle Aldred and uh, and Renee Moylanen. They're of Starcrest Consulting Group. And they're going to speak on the drive to zero emissions. Um, Giselle uh, is based in Pennsylvania. Uh, she's been an environmental consultant for 25 years and uh, focuses developing activity based emissions inventories for the maritime industry and preparing grant applications. Um, Renee is based in California. And Renee has more than 20 years of experience. Video off there. Uh, 20 years of experience in development and implementation of policy and communications programs, with more than 15 years developing clean air strategies for some of the world's largest port facilities. Uh, today, Renee and Giselle will discuss zero emissions equipment for marine terminals and grants available at state at the state and federal level. 
Um, welcome to you too, and uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks for joining us. Okay, um, this is Renee. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So this is just a quick overview of what Giselle and I will be talking about today. I'm going to provide a little bit of background about zero emissions and then hand it over to Giselle to talk about funding and the status of zero emissions technology. Next slide. So first, what do we mean by zero emissions? So the definition that we're going to use today, which is the most common definition, is no pollutants from the tailpipe. So we are ignoring the upstream power plant emissions, which um, are not insignificant depending on the source of power in your state. If you're still using coal or even a lot of natural gas, zero emissions may not actually be cleaner than diesel. But for the purposes of today's discussion and most of the conversation, we're looking at technologies that eliminate pollutants at the tailpipe. And today, those two technologies are battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell. They eliminate all nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, sulfur oxides, and zero emission technology is also the only technology platform that eliminates greenhouse gases, which is the cause of climate change. And that's because it's eliminating fossil fuel consumption. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, the other thing we mentioned up here is battery electric hybrid. This is equipment that has uh, a battery pack, but usually a very small combustion engine. Not necessarily zero emissions, maybe it's near zero emissions, but we've included it here because it's a very good transitional technology um, and good for um, some near term options for folks who are still looking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but not necessarily go to full zero. Next slide. So you've probably been hearing a lot about zero emissions. There's a lot of talk about it in the news. Um, just a, a couple things going on in the US up in the Northwest, the seaports up there along with Vancouver in Canada, just adopted a clean air strategy that calls for zero emissions at the ports by 2050. The U.S. is pressing the International Maritime Organization to modify its greenhouse gas targets so that the shipping sector can become zero emissions by 2050. And um, last year, more than 15 states and the District of Columbia joined together on an agreement to go to zero emissions by 2050 in the medium and heavy duty transportation sector. And they also have an interim goal of 30 percent zero emission sales by 2030. So lots of activity here. Next slide. California, not surprisingly, um, even more aggressive. Uh, the state is considering changes to the cargo handling equipment regulation that would uh, push for a transition to full zero emissions um, for terminal equipment with implementation starting in 2026. And the goal would be to have the majority of emission reductions occurring by 2031. Next slide. So this is a map showing those states that have agreed to work together on getting the medium and heavy duty sector to zero emissions by 2050. And what you'll notice is it's pretty concentrated along the coasts, right? So if you are a seaport, if you haven't heard about this, you probably will be. There's going to be a lot of seaports that are going to be swept up in this push for zero emissions. Next slide. And this is a map showing um, either demonstrations or deployments of zero emission technology at seaports. Um, and what you'll see is it's really happening across the country. It's not necessarily concentrated in one area. There's a lot of activity nationwide. Um, a few caveats about this map. So the first is that it doesn't show you the scale. And uh, we know, for example, there's more than 100 demonstrations and deployments of zero emission equipment happening on the West Coast. Um, you don't get that sense from this map. And the other big caveat is that these are just the deployments and demonstrations that we knew about. And we're quite sure that we're missing a lot of activity in other seaports. 
So um, if you wouldn't mind, if you've got a demonstration of zero emissions equipment or if you've deployed zero emissions equipment or you're planning on it, just write in the chat the name of your port and the type of equipment that you're looking at. We always love to keep on top of what all the ports across the country are doing. Uh, next slide. So this is the last point I'll make before I hand it over to Giselle. Um, and it's that there really is a, a place for zero emissions, especially if we want to eliminate greenhouse gases and, and climate change. Uh, and this graph, I'm going to kind of walk you through it here. This is showing the emission reductions in Port of Long Beach, Port of Los Angeles that have occurred since 2005. The light blue bars are showing the emission reductions just from cargo handling equipment. The darker bars are showing overall emission reductions from all of the different sources, trucks, ships, rail, everything. And what you can see is that um, for cargo handling equipment emissions for NOx and PM, the cargo handling equipment has actually exceeded the overall emissions of the port, and it's pretty close on sulfur oxides. And that's due to more stringent engine standards from the EPA, the turnover to cleaner equipment, the use of ultra low sulfur diesel um, in these ports. But when you look at greenhouse gases on the far right, you'll see that greenhouse gas emissions from cargo handling equipment has actually increased 20%, even though overall at the ports, the GHGs are down 17%. And this is because cargo throughput is going up when um, there's more activity on the ports, you guys are using the equipment more and you're using more fuel. And as we said earlier, this is the only way to get to eliminate fuel use and reduce greenhouse gas emissions is to just go zero emissions. And so um, just wanted to point out, this is not necessarily a solution in search of a problem. This is a real uh, push for zero emissions in order to eliminate those greenhouse gases. And now I'm going to hand it over to Giselle, who's going to talk about how we do that. So next slide. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here to talk to you about funding and uh, technology status. I decided to go ahead and talk about funding first since uh, sustainable technology, renewable energy and infrastructure happens to be at the forefront of many discussions, as we saw last week at the G7 summit. And also, um, even today, uh, the infrastructure bill, it's on the news. Uh, we might get a bipartisan um, infrastructure bill soon. And um, all of this is important for terminals as you decide um, whether to modernize your terminal or go down the path to zero emission uh, equipment. I know a lot of you are, um, probably um, used to grants in this for security. Um, so I would like to see a raise of hands of who has worked on a grant, whether on the front end with the application or at the back end when the project is being um, developed and the award. And you may know of a lot of um, different uh, reporting requirements. So next slide. As I imagine that there are some of you that are familiar with grants, whether environmental or security, and some of the stuff that I'm gonna to talk to you um, today about planning ahead, you may already be aware of this, as this could um, be for any type of grant. Um, but from the environmental side, it's good to know what type of grants uh, and funding is out there. Um, up to now, we tend to think of equipment um, grants and there's two types of equipment grant the most familiar or the, or the one that's um, out there for the last 10 years has been to scrap an existing fossil fuel equipment and replace it with uh, either zero emission or lower emission equipment um, this has worked out uh, to a very good extent, except for now in California, where we're seeing that all the equipment, all the existing equipment is fairly new, it's tier four. So, and the activity 
is going up, as we just saw that Port of LA was on the news um, with the 10 million TEU uh, mark for the fiscal year. So some terminals may not want to scrap any of their equipment as they're adding, as they would like to add to their fleet, let's say. So the other type of equipment um, funding that's popular and it may not be available in all of the states, but it's a voucher, which means you can add to your fleet the zero emission uh, equipment and do get a financial break on it and not necessarily have to scrap any equipment. Um, so that, of course, is very popular among terminals to just be able to add the zero emission equipment to the fleet. And we would like to talk to you also about infrastructure um, from two fronts. One is when you're purchasing the zero emission equipment, um, even if it comes with a charger included in the cost, you should also think about other infrastructure uh, costs that there may be, like civil work, electrical work. Uh, you may need to run a line to it, and that would be like a, at a minimum. And at a maximum, you may not have enough power um, at the terminal to be able to completely turn over your whole fleet to zero emissions. So infrastructure is very important. And secondly, we believe that uh, the path to zero emission funding, it'll, it won't be enough for this uh, equipment grants. Uh, you may have to go after the infrastructure grants, which they have been in the news. And uh, in the past, we've tended to think about infrastructure grants as just uh, road work, bridge work, um, rail expansion. But I do believe that in the future, uh, due to this administration, and we've already seen it, it has an environmental component. So any marine terminal that is thinking of um, modernizing, whether it be to meet the larger vessels, and you may need um, larger ship to shore power cranes, uh, if you include some zero emission equipment and be able to show that the total package does reduce emissions, then um, we believe that the infrastructure grants may be a good way uh, or path for you to go to move forward. Um, I would also like to speak to you about uh, matching funds, that it's very important that um, these projects are so expensive and you know that the grants will only pay up to a certain limit and then they expect the private entity to pay the rest. Well, there's grants that are stackable, which means that they allow you to um, submit the same project for several grants. And that way, another grant, a second grant could pay for that matching fu um, funding that you have to pay for. And sometimes it requires a, a little bit of luck to be able to find more than one grant that's out at the same time and that you meet all the requirements and, you know, that has the same schedule and that you can submit. But we have seen um, terminals and private entities able to do this. The cost. Um, we tell our clients that it's good in the planning ahead to go ahead and, and ask for the quotes for the equipment. First, make a wish list of all the equipment that you want to replace and then get the quotes and any of the infrastructure work that may need to be done. Also have the cost for that because once the grants come out, they are only open for like a six um, week window. And as you all know, um, you may need to go to a parent company, which is overseas, um, to ask for permission to spend money. Since a lot of these grants, you need to have the money available uh, in your budget because you have to pay for it up front. And then once the project is completed, then the grant will pay um, their portion. So if you wait until the last minute, once the grant comes out, to uh, put this in your budget or plan ahead, you may miss out that window for the grant. So having the project almost on like the shelf, already 
have a, the cost and all the planning done ahead of time um, will make it easier for, for the terminals to submit a grant. And then the last two have to do with reading the, fi the fine print. Um, you won't want to spend too much time applying on a grant if you don't meet the eligibility requirements. And what we've noticed is the way some of these grants are written, they almost tend to box themselves in where it's so specific as to what they're looking for. So it's best to read the requirements ahead of time and make sure that you do uh, meet them before submitting an application. And then be aware of the reporting requirements. Any of you that have done grants um, can attest to the bulk of the work comes at the end. Once you've been awarded that funding, the project has been submitted, and now comes the reporting requirements. You have to submit a final report. Some of them, some of them have um, 10 years of annual reporting that you have to submit. Now, I don't want to like not make you want to go after grants, but it's just something that you need to um, be aware of and possibly have somebody in mind within your organization to be able to follow through with a grant. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about federal funding. Um, unfortunately, we do not have time to be able to go over all of these uh, listed. Um, but there are uh, so many federal funding out there available, and most of them do come out annually, usually at the beginning of the year, like the first quarter, second quarter, that's the busy um, season for grants. Uh, one item with federal grants, is, it's not like that for all of them, but for most of them, you do have to submit um, through a public agency. So in your case, that would be a port authority. Um, so that's another reason to be, to have a plan ahead of time because you also, besides getting the green light internally, you also have to ask the port authority ahead of time if they can submit on your behalf. And sometimes the port authorities may have their own projects that they wanna submit or you're competing against other terminals um, that are the tenants that are also um, interested in the grant. So the sooner that you can um, have your project ready um, and talk to the Port Authority, uh, the better. The only good thing about uh, having the Port Authority submitted on your behalf is that they get to do the legwork on the application and on the paperwork. Um, the I think the EPA there, most of you are familiar with that one. That's That would be considered an equipment replacement. And then the infra and the raise um, by the DOT, those are um, infrastructure grants, which are now beginning to have that environmental component to it. And then the DOT, Mara, the, the port um, infrastructure development program, that one has always been geared towards ports. And I was looking at that one just in the two years, uh, in the last two years, um, $2 billion were submitted um, worth of applications. Of course, not everybody received the grant, but that just goes to show you how um, marine terminals and port authorities, uh, how interested they are in, in, in getting an infrastructure grant. I put as a reference the EPA Ports Initiative uh, website because they have all of the grants listed, not just for federal, also some private and some state, and they're all geared towards marine terminals and port authorities. So I would, um, I believe that's a good resource. Uh, of course, the port authority. Um, you can always ask, ask them as they always track grants. They would also be a good resource. Next. For state funding, um, each state has their own um, part of money and, and different uh, incentives that they provide. Um, there's too many to list. I, I happen to list California and Texas because those are the ones that I'm most familiar with. Um, this last few years, the Volkswagen Mitigation Trust Fund, um, that has been extra 
funding that every state has had in I believe we're towards the end stage for that type of funding um, at the state level. And there's so many state funding. Uh, I would say um, if you belong to the Clean Diesel Collaborative, uh, different regions have them and they do a good job about reminding um, their members about when grants are coming up, uh, when they're open. And before I leave grants, I want to say that there's also private funding. Um, sometimes there's construct large construction projects or dredging projects where they may want to offset their emissions. So from time to time, um, private funding uh, becomes available. Uh, Renee and I are aware of these, but it's mostly through vessel repowers as they, those are good projects. Um, they get a lot of emission reductions and it's cost effective and they only need a few projects in order to meet their offset. But other times um, they may look at other projects that are not marine vessel repowers. So your best bet is to if you have a large project coming up or a very special project with a new technology, uh, do talk to your state agencies and they may be aware of either private funding or they may also have their own um, part of money where they haven't decided um, which project that it should go to and, and they may be able to say, oh, you know, we, we could help you. So. I know sometimes um, marine terminals, we tend to not want to say too much um, because of competitive, you know, competition and you don't want to, you, you don't want to hear uh, another terminal, you know, what your plans are. But if you do talk to the state agencies or to the port authority, um, they may, you know, they might be able to help you with funding. Next. So this leads me to the technology status. And for some reason on my screen, I'm not seeing um, the pictures, but that's okay. The, there are projects or equipment that are already on the commercial stay, um, stage, while there's others that are still in the demonstration or conceptual. Today, we're mainly gonna be talking about um, the projects that are at container terminals. And the reason why I, phrase it this way. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay, here we go. So it's because let's say yard tractors, um, they may be already commercialized and in use at distribution centers and at smaller marine terminals. But when it comes to the container terminals, it's still in the demonstration um, phase. Um, we, can, we can move to the next slide. And I'll be going over the, these um, specific equipment uh, one at a time. So as I've mentioned, battery electric yard tractors, there's so many different manufacturers out there. And I still see um, new names coming into the mix with battery electric um, yard tractors. Uh, to this day in the West Coast at the container terminals, this is still in demonstration mode. Um, I just talked to a terminal this week that they just finished one demonstration project with one manufacturer and they're going on to another manufacturer to demonstrate it. The reason for this is um, if you have like high activity and maybe only one hour between the shifts, it's just very hard to, uh, for the battery, te the battery technology is just not there to be able to, um, charge so fast in between shifts and continue to the next one. So, and yes, that is the Dole San Diego. Um, we tried to put some from um, the, the different coasts. Uh, next. Um, for zero emission container handlers, uh, there are two top handlers that have been demonstrated. Uh, on the West Coast at a container terminal, and I've heard um, only good things coming out of that demonstration project. 
And I do believe that, um, I, I believe it's already, you, you can purchase one of these, it's already been demonstrated. So I, I won't be surprised if we start seeing zero electric uh, top handers at marine terminals uh, pretty soon. Next, for zero emission forklifts, um, they're commercialized. Uh, I know of a lot of marine terminals and of course distribution centers, warehouses, they're already used to using the smaller um, battery electric forklifts. And if I'm not mistaken, up to now, uh, up to 36,000 uh, pound capacity, they are commercial. And the heavy lifts, I would say they're still in the, in the demonstration phase, um, but I've heard of many uh, companies, both European and American, that have come out with um, their concept of a heavy lift, uh, zero emission. There's, of course, I put in a picture of a Toyota hydrogen fuel cell, as that one is being um, tested at the moment and We'll see what happens with, with the hydrogen fuel cell. I do know this month, um, the Port of Los Angeles was in the news with uh, hydrogen fuel cell trucks that they're going to demonstrate. So a lot of exciting uh, new technology that's coming out. Next. Okay, straddle carriers and shuttle carriers, uh, the hybrid concept, it's commercialized, it's being used um, from coast to coast, and um, everybody enjoys the hybrid because it lowers on the fuel consumption, the cost, and they're able to um, lower the emissions. Uh, this year, in the East Coast at the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, we're gonna have uh, an electric, straddle carrier being demonstrated and if i'm not mistaken um it's going to have like a fast charger so i'm really excited to see how that demonstration um goes and if i'm not mistaken i believe it's the first one in the u.s for an electric straddle carrier and um i'm gonna go fast because i do see that um there are um, notes, and I do hope that we have time for for question and answer, and that Renee's um, reading some some of the um, chat. So, if we could go on to the next one, okay? Hybrid and zero electric RTGs, both fully commercial, both being used on either side of um, on both coasts. Um, I believe that Georgia Port Authority would be like uh, the one to take the prize for uh, having the first of, of both hybrid and zero electric and also probably having the most. Um, but I think on the West Coast, um, some of the terminals have um, embraced also the, the, the hybrid RTGs and then one terminal in the West Coast has uh, zero emission RTGs. And I believe that there's the bus bar and the cable reel for, for those two. So next, please. Um, even though we're talking about zero emissions, I always like to throw in some near-term alternatives for fossil fuel equipment um, since as somebody said, the grid is woefully unprepared for the demand. Yes, I agree. We have a long road um, to get there. And in the meantime, there's so much that um, could be done to reduce emissions without having to go to battery electric. Or, uh, and some of them are uh, renewable diesel. That's um, becoming... Um, I don't want to say the word popular, but it's on people's mind. And uh, just last week or two weeks ago, a West Coast terminal, container terminal mentioned that they had completely switched over to renewable diesel. And they had been at it for a month. 
and so far they're happy. Um, and what they liked about it is that it doesn't change their operations. They were able to use the same um, fuel storage tanks, the same fuel trucks that fuel their equipment. All that they had to do was empty it and then put the new um, renewable diesel in there. And so, so, so that's one option. I just haven't seen any emissions testing on it, so I am very curious to see what the actual emission reductions are. Uh, then, of course, there's low NOx certified engines um, that are meeting the 0 0.02 grams uh, per horsepower hour for NOx emissions. Uh, most of these are trucks, uh, either natural gas or propane, and they're fully commercial and on the roads already as we speak. And lastly, there's a start-stop uh, technology, which may would make um, vocational trucks hybrid. And this is especially good for those that have um, high idling. And so terminal tractors would be um, one of the vocational trucks that um, could use the hybrid technology. And uh, garbage trucks used at cities um, so there's a lot that can be done now. Uh, next. And this concludes uh, the presentation. Both Renee and I um, wanted to make it um, as quickly as possible because as we would love to hear from you. Yeah, we'll, we can uh, definitely open it up. You saw there's a lot of, uh, a lot of dialogue going on on the side there as people were throwing different things out and um and i'm not sure if uh lauren or if you guys had collected some of these some of the questions or if we just want to throw it out there uh throw it out there for the group um i, I personally i i'm interested in the in the work cycle of the, of the vehicles and what you just mentioned about the idling on the terminals with what we're dealing with now with the congestion in the terminals um there is a lot of truck idling right now outside truck especially i think the the terminal trucks are, are doing their thing but for the the delivery and and all that it's, it's it can take take them a while to get their containers and um that start stop technology is is interesting but uh but the outside truckers are probably a, a larger emitter of the of the emissions now than than the terminal equipment currently uh, just because of the idling so i think that has to be addressed yeah i mean you know one of the question. challenges <laughs> sorry um well i do i mean i think one of the challenges in the talk about zero emissions is that is that well, typically i'm sorry i'm hearing a little Okay, um, typically cargo handling equipment is not the biggest slice of the pie in terms of the emissions. I mean, the ships are huge sources of emissions at ports, the trucks. So um, it's definitely, you know, it, it's definitely that there's often a lot of attention on terminal equipment because that's, you know, ports have control somewhat over terminal equipment. Um, and there are a lot of emerging options in zero emissions, but you're exactly right. It's, you know, the, the push for zero emissions has to be larger than terminal equipment. It has to look at trucks and, and other source categories as well. I, should we start addressing some of the um, questions that have come up in the chat? Or did we want to open it up for? Yeah, yeah. Address those as they came up, if you if you can. That helps a lot. Keep it kind of orderly. Okay. I yeah. I took down some notes, and maybe I'll Giselle. I'll give you a little break for a bit, but feel free to to chime in. Um, so I'll I'll talk about the the source of funding for a lot of the grants. Uh, it the short answer is it depends. In some cases, it's taxpayer dollars. So for example, the, the DIRA, EPA's DIRA, is federal funding that you could say is taxpayer dollars. Uh, the Volkswagen funding is from a private company that is paying penalties. So that's those are private dollars. In California, there are grant programs that are funded by vehicle license registration fees. 
There's a ton of funding coming out of cap and trade, which is largely funded by private entities that are trying to offset their emissions. So it's highly dependent. It's not all taxpayer dollars. And I think, you know, a lot of the states and agencies that have these programs would also argue that there are taxpayer taxpayer benefits associated with grant programs that help to transition to cleaner equipment and don't put the entire burden on the terminal operators and other private industry partners um, to pay for all of that. So um, a lot of these programs like EPA's DERA program is enormously popular with bipartisan support, which is not easy, um, but it's because it's a relatively small amount of money in the federal budget that gets um, that supports private companies in transitioning to cleaner equipment. So there's actually a lot of support for that. Um, there was also a comment about um, union jobs. So I don't know if I'm going to be able, if I'm going to answer exactly what this question was. I think it was Tony who who asked it. But one thing that I think we've noticed is that um, zero emissions often gets conflated with automation. And the truth is they're totally separate. So zero emissions is a technology platform. Automation is an operational strategy. And it is true that you can be automated and have zero emissions equipment. You can also be automated and not have zero emissions equipment. So if you go out and you replace a diesel yard tractor with an electric yard tractor, you still largely have the same number of people who are required to operate that equipment. Um, so, you know, if if there are concerns, you know, with among the labor force, it, it could be related to this fear that it has to be, um, you know, automated, which is it's not the case. Now, it does make it a lot more expensive to go to zero emissions. And so, you know, that has led some terminals to potentially look at ways of boosting productivity in other ways, which could be automation, but the two do not necessarily need to be linked. Um, and then the PMSA electrification study. So yes, that so that study, if you're not familiar with it, was looking at the push for electrification in California, which is not just focused on terminal equipment, but the state has increased the shore power requirements for ships. So they'll be plugging in at higher rates and more ships will be plugging in. There's also new regulations coming out to electrify, um, I shouldn't say electrify, to move to zero emissions, um, which could be hydrogen, for trucks, um, ultimately for harbor craft, for you know, even light duty passenger cars. There's just a major push and there absolutely will be impact on the grid. And um, a couple things I'll say about that. If your terminal is looking at going to electrification, then you should really be taking a comprehensive terminal wide perspective. You should be looking at how you are going to manage the load across the terminal and it is extremely difficult at a terminal because you work on these tight shifts there is a limited amount of time when potentially all of the equipment might be plugged in at once which is going to send your demand through the roof so looking at um, battery storage microgrids renewable sources to help uh, diffuse that load is going to be critical and it really needs to be a holistic terminal wide view of this transition. And then um, the last thing I'll mention is that planning is going to be critical. If you're thinking about going to zero emissions, you should be talking to your utility today. They have very long planning horizons. Um, you know, in California, the date is roughly 2035 to move many of these sectors to zero emissions. If people start today, that might be enough time to make sure that the grid can support the transition. If we wait another five years, we're probably going to be in trouble. So planning and, and planning today is a critical step, um, not just for the state, but individual terminals that might be interested in this. Um, 
So I'll pause there. Those were the notes that I had written down. I don't know if there were other. There's a question about um, hydrogen fuel cells. Are they a better option for marine terminal operations? I don't know if you want to take that one, Renee. Well, you know, again, this is, you really have to look at your operations and the total cost of ownership. There's pros and cons. You know, hydrogen equipment is generally much more expensive than electric, although it depends on the cost of electricity uh, in your state and in your in your utility. Uh, so, but over the course of, of the total cost of ownership over the lifetime of the equipment, hydrogen tends to be more expensive, but it functions much more like diesel equipment. So if you're worried about, you know, the flex of having flexibility to be able to operate your terminal with relatively few changes, then hydrogen might be a better option. And I, and I do get the sense, at least on the West Coast, that more and more terminal operators are starting to look at hydrogen more than electric. The hydrogen terminal equipment is much farther behind in terms of demonstration. So I don't know how much of it is that terminal operators have sort of been playing around with the electric equipment for a while and, you know, aren't happy with it or no, notice that there's a lot of challenges. Uh, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on fuel cell uh, terminal equipment. Um, but those demonstrations are starting to happen. So it's really a case by case. I think that was kind of the road I was going down when you talk about work cycles and, and such and, and infrastructure grid. Um, it, it, it's interesting to me that we've probably had most success with hybridization, like with our RTGs in Oakland. Um, it, it, it seems like creating your own electricity or your own you know, fuel source for that vehicle or uh, electric or whatever on board is for our for our in industrial environment is much better because uh and it may just be where it where it ends up i think the work cycle is going to drive what design will work the best and that what you're talking about charging between shifts the you know the the cost of uh, of electric uh, uh chge and things like that you know hybridizing is is probably a good a good uh, transition for our terminals but um Anybody else have some questions? Hey, Rob, Rob, Tony Flores. Go, Tony. Hey, Rob. Yeah, so like someone mentioned earlier there about the, the grid we have now. Um, this particular governor is, is uh, known for his blackouts and rolling brownouts. Um, I, I think a lot of us have talked about it uh, probably offline, but uh, uh, and not that being overtaxed here in this particular uh, um, California that we live in. I, I'm wondering how, how they're going to address that. How, how can that be addressed if, if we can't uh, handle the, the power required now with all these other things that are coming our way and without hammering the taxpayers and driving the rest of us out of here? Yeah, I'm not sure we can answer that question. <laughs> it's definitely a much bigger question. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to do to, to get the grid ready. Now, California also has requirements for the utilities to increasingly shift more and more of the energy production to renewable sources like solar and wind and, you know, gradually moving away from natural gas. So there's that element as well in California. Um, but resiliency is going to be a huge issue. There's 100% agree that for the goods movement industry, it's not acceptable to have your power go out for an hour. So that's something that every terminal is going to need to work closely with the utilities. I will say that in talking to the utilities, at least at a high level, um, they tend to be fairly confident in their ability to provide power. <laughs> now on a specific terminal or in a specific area or city, there might be some challenges, but 
overall, they seem optimistic about their ability to ramp up for it. They know electrification is coming. They are starting their planning processes and, and starting to work on it. But um, the, the transition to zero emissions technology cannot be understated in terms of the disruption that it will have on the industry. This is like when the steam engine went to internal combustion engine. It is a wholesale change in technology in the way that the transportation sector has been doing business. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's probably going to happen over decades. Uh, but eventually, it probably will happen and operations may need to change uh, the way that we you know support the infrastructure may need to change it will be expensive but i think there's the general sense that we can debate the timelines and california no doubt has very aggressive timelines but ultimately the transition will occur Probably agree. Just one more comment on that. Uh, I got to believe most of the folks that are that are pushing this or are for all this uh, innovation probably haven't worked a vessel yet. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, understanding of the uh, of the pro of the process and of the of the work environment that we're in is is crucial of that. But I think that's how you know you get together with with people who are involved in the work, and you get to you know people will come to some reality at some point where they're going to try and match the technology with the reality. Um, and that's why I think it's not you, you can't drive them drive them down to zero and and dictate what kind of equipment they're going to use. But I think necessity is the mother of invention, right? They're going to you know, if if they make the mandate and that's what they choose to do, in, in our case, port operations just can't move out of the state. Other industries can. So, um, right. interesting. Right. There, there's a, a good question here about um, about the difference between zero emissions and near zero. I wonder if there's a, a, a good uh, explanation for the group on that. I mean, generally, near zero emissions is anything that has some level of combustion engine. So there is some level of pollutant coming out of the tailpipe, but it can be very, very small. I mean, the near zero emission heavy duty trucks, for example, in California, emit 0 0.02 grams of NOx per brake horsepower, 0 0.02. Um, very small, just about zero, but still considered near zero emissions. And I think part of that question was also sort of referencing the upstream power plant generation. Um, and most commonly people sort of ignore that, at least in the US. In, in Europe, they're a little bit more, um, they sort of include that a little bit more, but in the US, they, we sort of ignore those, those emissions, but you know, they can absolutely be significant. And Starcrest has done studies of electrification in other parts of the world that are heavily dependent on coal-fired power plants, for example, where electrification is actually worse than using diesel. So it, you really have to to look at it and, and make sure it's it's the best, um, you know, for, for your operations. One other thing I would add in terms of the the people who are making the rules not necessarily understanding the operations, I agree with you. I would also urge folks on this call to help those people by educating them about your operations. And I know it's it's tough to sort of put yourself out there and you know working with the people who might be making regulations that impact you. But my experience with a lot of the regulators is that they don't always get it right, but they want to get it right. And they do want to understand your operations more. And so I would encourage the folks on this call to, you know, invite these folks down for a tour, really show them how how challenging things are going to be and what some of the, the real barriers might be and try to work towards some understanding or solutions with them.
I think that's uh, I think that's good advice. Um, anytime you're working with the regulators, it, it makes a big difference. So, are there uh, are there other questions that we can pass on to our speakers, or should we move on? Okay, I don't see any more coming up on the side, and um, I'm sure if anybody has anything further, they can contact you guys. Your contact information, and thank you so much for spending the time to talk to us. It's uh, it's near and dear to all of our hearts. It impacts our operations, and and very uh, very important information for us to know. And uh, besides helping the environment, it'll help the the health of our of our workplace as well. So uh, appreciate you taking the time. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move it. Uh, Joe, are you on? I'm here. I'm here. Okay, I'm gonna have to mute because I I send off some kind of space age sound if I have my thing on while you're talking. So I'll leave it to you uh, for the next. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe Farley. I'm the NIMSA TC chairman. It is my pleasure to introduce our next sponsor and NIMSA friend, David Hall and Red Wing Shoes. David is the National Account Manager at Red Wing Shoe Company, a 116-year-old company that provides footwear as well as full PPE solutions around the world. His duties include consulting with a wide variety of industries on hazard assessment and coordination, implementation, and oversight of safety PPE programs. In his 28 years with Red Wing, David has been recognized multiple times for sales awards and employees excellence and has been published in occupational health and safety magazines on the subject of safety programs. This will mark the 16th NIMSA annual meeting that David has attended. And thank you very much for that time, David. David, it's all yours, buddy. Great, thank you for that introduction, Joe. Appreciate that. Can uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, David, yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, yeah, thanks again, Joe. Appreciate that. Uh, it's wonderful to be back with everybody. I uh, want to thank President Dita. I want to thank uh, Director Brand. Um, we'll we'll kind of jump right into uh, the, uh, the slides that I've got. Um, so uh, a little about Red Wing Shoe Company. What the goal will be to just kind of talk a little bit about Red Wing. Um, also then uh, talk about uh, how we're um, committed to safety uh, specifically in the maritime industry and talk about some of the neat uh, new uh, things that we've got uh, uh, working uh, over here at Red Wing Shoe Company. So we are a, a global supplier of PPE. Uh, we do have uh, vertical integration with our leather tanneries. Um, we've made uh, some pretty significant technology investments, and um, we'll uh, we'll kind of go through those. Um, so head to toe protection. We're known for footwear. That's how we started back in uh, 1905. Um, again, I've not been with them that whole time. I've been with them 28 years, but uh, it's a wonderful company to work with. I started right out of college, ran a store, uh, was an operations manager um, in Ohio, and uh, kind of been doing this role since uh, 1999. Red Wings, uh, you would expect we would... Uh, you know, go through and, and have uh, very rigorous testing and, and um, make sure that our, our boots are going to be able to stand up to the reputation and stand up to all the standards that, uh, you know, that we have to pass, uh, whether it's uh, ASTM, um, any of the other global um, standards that we uh, build footwear for around the world. And the same is true for the rest of our PPE. Um, we do have an internal laboratory that we use, which is somewhat rare within the industry. Um, they, uh, we have all the same testing that's done third party from EH testing to the drop test to the puncture, uh, you know, test. Um, most every one of the testing, uh, but so we have the ability to, uh, you know, make sure that the product is going to stand up to the rigors of what you're employees are, are demanding of it. Uh, Red Wing has, as I mentioned, uh, been committed to um, 
safety. Uh, I've been a longtime partner in the maritime industry. Um, we're proud of the partnership that we have. Um, we've had a program since the inception of the PMA footwear program um, and also other programs with a lot of you other um, uh, NIMS and members uh, and individually as well. So I want to thank you for that uh, partnership and for your leadership and safety. As part of that, uh, we've done a couple of different videos. There is a video series that Red Wing has on our website um, that kind of just uh, short videos talking about, uh, you know, interesting different jobs uh, kind of around the world. And one of them focused on uh, Joan Stevedoring. And uh, so there's a little snapshot here of uh, Mr. Tim Fowler, who uh, you know is quoted there talking about safety and talking about his operations, a logging operation uh, in Longview. We've also done some other highlights of other videos um, with some other uh, maritime industry uh, companies, as well as some uh, help fund some safety um, uh, videos um, that uh, that we've kind of co-sponsored. So we're very proud of that uh, relationship and uh, with our, you know, with our history. This is a quick uh, shot of the different uh, videos that we've got. Uh, kind of does a tour uh, of the tannery and of uh, some different aspects of the manufacturing as well as the testing. So I invite you to go take a look at those. Um, what it was really our goal here uh, within the um, safety division of Red Wing Shoe Company is to protect your workers. That's the bottom line. And we also want to make that uh, as easy as possible. And uh, we do have uh, an enhanced program, uh, Red Wing for Business program, that I'm not going to go into too much of the details. You're going to expect with a brand like Red Wing that we have, uh, you know, a, a very easy to implement uh, program. We can help you from, um, you know, the start to to the invoicing. Uh, we we will offer um, to do hazard assessments, PPE hazard assessments, um, and then implement the program. We have digital vouchers, um, and uh, a lot of uh, really. Um, the envy of the industry really, as far as footwear uh, retail locations, there's 1,200 retail locations. There's a website. It's all very digital. You can take a look and see where those are at. We have shoe mobiles that can come on site as that's you know feasible. And if it matches up with your your you know business model, maybe it's outside of the uh, the gate. But um, we do have very much customizable websites. I'll show you a couple of screenshots of those and a very streamlined warranty process. Um, again, 1,200 Red Wing retailers that support our national programs around the country. I think I went ahead just a bit. So um, in, doing, uh, in doing the program, again, you can give us and load in your employees information that can get issued by um, email and or by text. So you have the ability to, uh, um, you know, really manage your your program from a portal that we host for you. Um, it's it's very easy to see who's been issued, um, you know, vouchers and who's redeemed them. And if you have turnover, it's easy enough to uh, cancel those out too. On our website, I mentioned about the store uh, locator. We have a locator internationally and domestically. And here's kind of a heat map of where our stores are. So you can simply type in um, a city and or uh, a zip code and that'll, you know, pop up the closest stores. You can take a look at uh, the details and it uh, takes you turn by turn right into those. Um, we also have, I mentioned, a customized website that can show all of the products available to your employees. They can be sorted in a, a wide uh, variety of different ways if you wanted to kind of chop those up you can click on one particular boot get more detailed information uh, different views and um, 
coming soon, we'll have an e-commerce option that your employees will have the ability to just order the shoes and have them shipped directly to them. So we're excited about that uh, multi-channel, uh, omni-channel um, option. And that'll work in conjunction with our stores and trucks um, eventually. So we're pretty excited about that. We have a value added um, support and service after the sale. And uh, the lifetime tune up program is what we call that. Uh, we can clean your boots, polish them, um, treat them with either uh, you know conditioner or oil, uh, replace the laces as uh, if they're needed or any hooks or eyelets, hardware on the boots, and even do minor repairs. And that's all at no charge at uh, Red Wing shoe stores. Not every one of our branded accounts uh, would be on there, but it's at most of all of our Red Wing shoe stores. So we want to help your employees take care of their boots. So they get longer life out of them. Um, I didn't really look at the agenda before we put this together, but uh, you know, kind of taking a look at um, taking care of the planet. A Red Wing shoe company also has a sustainability initiative. So uh, the red wing is, is going green, uh, although that's not going to change our and our logo. But we are making um, some of our footbeds uh, and EVA insoles with an invasive algae. So isn't that a, a interesting? Uh, the, the bloom, if I'm saying that right, bloom foam um, is uh, is utilizing uh, algae for the production and uh, and help uh, you know basically taking a look at water consumption and reducing our uh, carbon savings in addition uh, we have a new line of full footwear that um, there's the new eco light family um, that uh, uses more recycled materials i'm not going to read the entire information but uh, coming soon these are going to be out in the spring and uh, we're excited about uh, this particular initiative um, with our new product. Um, this kind of goes to show, this highlights some of the different uh, features that 50% uh, more recycled plastic bottles, for example, used in the upper in the mesh. Uh, the sole has uh, some um, recycled material in it as well. Red Wing Shoe Company has also signed a 25-year lease uh, to uh, buy its power through solar uh, here in Red Wing, where we do have our grid kind of supported by the local uh, nuclear power plant. Um, so I thought that was kind of uh, interesting with the, with the uh, topic of discussion today. So um, it is a privately held company. Um, it, it's a great place to work. I'm, I'm very proud and, and uh, feel very blessed to be with Red Wing Shoe Company. Some of the other things that uh, we do as a company, we would get several different uh, uh, people that you know got rather attached to their to their boot that they would wear, um, and then upon their retirement, uh, or maybe after it saved them from a near, you know, um, serious accident. Uh, we would have these boots sent into us. So we decided to start to honor some of the stories and some of the people behind this. But uh, this is just kind of a way that uh, we, we will um, take a look and um, lift up the stories and honor the people that uh, are, are working hard, you know, in the trades. Um, we encourage you to apply on the website. There is an application if you want to um, have somebody uh, at your company that you'd like to uh, nominate for the wall of honor. Um, ordinary people just really dedicated for, to their work that uh, that are wearing their red wings and and uh, feel kind of a uh, a pride in their work. So it's, it's kind of a unique um, program. And uh, this is at our flagship store in Red Wing, Minnesota, uh, Deepwater Port on the Mississippi. No, it's actually not Deepwater, but uh, uh, part of the lock and dam system here uh, just south of minneapolis um so that's the wall of honor and um i kind of buzzed through a lot of that i'm not sure if uh you, we'll open it up for any questions but i just want to kind of close uh the prepared remarks by again thanking you uh, for the opportunity to be part of NIMSA. i look forward to seeing everybody back at the uh, biltmore in miami next year 
Um, we appreciate the opportunity to partner with uh, all of you that uh, we're on the call with that uh, are our customers. And um, I'd be very, I'd be thrilled to talk with any of you about your PPE programs if you're looking to uh, review those. Um, and with that, I'll just, I'll open it up if there's any, uh, any questions. I'm sure Joe's got some kind of a softball one for me, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Dave. No, uh, no softball, but I just want to compliment you. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is your 16th year that you've partnered with NIMSA, and uh, we really appreciate your commitment and partnership with the group. Uh, one thing you didn't mention, you did kind of like touch on it, but you, uh, you did help NIMSA develop a safety video on slips, trips, and falls. So uh, your partnership you, um, is really appreciated, and you've been a great, great asset to our organization. So let's, let's give uh, Dave a, a team's clap. All right, let's do a team's clap for Dave. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Joe. Right. Really appreciate Thank that. I'm, yeah. I'll be interested to hear the, the, the rest of the uh, day's uh, conversation. Thank yeah, you. Any, any, any questions for uh, Dave? You know, Dave, one, this one, is Mark. Go, go ahead, Mark. I, I found a red wing shoe golf ball in a, the other day. I think it's one I lost about three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you would have lost any of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Have you seen him play golf? <laughs> hey, Dave, this is Rob. Uh, I, uh, I I got to know that one of our foremen has a shoe up on that wall from Southern California. I think they should if they if they don't. Um, yeah, and and we would welcome any uh, nominations. So please uh, go to the website, take a look at the wall of honor. Wall of honor. Yep. It saved his feet. It's great. It was a it was a great uh, a, a great day for him, and uh, and you and your your shoe did its job. So thanks for that. You bet. That's that's what we build them for. Really good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. No further questions. We'll move on. Rob, you want me to introduce our next guest, my next speaker? Yep, that's your job, Joe. Right now. Okay. Thank you. It's my privilege since our next speaker, Ms. Adele Abrams. I first heard Ms. Abrams speak earlier this year on a webinar, as we all go to webinars now, and found her OSHA presentation very interesting and thought it'd be a great presentation to share with the NIMSA members and guests. We are honored today to welcome Ms. Abrams to NIMSA. She will discuss a forecast of what will or may occur in the OSHA under the new Biden administration. Ms. Abrams is an attorney and is, is president of her own firm, with offices in Maryland, West Virginia, and Colorado. Her firm focuses on safety, health, and employment law nationwide. Adele is a great columnist for numerous magazines on legal, employment, mine, occupational self, safety, and health issues, and is co-author of several books related to mining, construction, employment law, and occupational safety and health. Without further ado, join me in welcome Ms. Adele Ravens. Welcome, Adele. Well, thank you, and uh, let's see if it'll let me uh, share uh, my screen. Uh, are you seeing that? Not just yet. Not yet. Not yet. OK, uh, hang on a sec. Let's get back here. Um, it's the button okay. right next. Yeah, to I know. I know. I've, I've got it. Uh, <laughs> let's see. We just had a misfire before. Um, you should see it now. There, there you go. go. That's better. There we go. OK, well, thank you all. And uh, I'm pleased to be part of your program here today, uh, looking into my crystal ball and uh, seeing what's in there besides a little bit of fog, because uh, uh, certainly there are a lot of things that are still uh, definitely to be determined. Uh, but I'm going to give you the best uh, forecast that I can uh, starting from basically the new administration and moving on from there. And uh, indeed, we do have a new sheriff in town, uh, in case anybody was uh, asleep like Rip Van, Rip Van Winkle for a while. Um, President Biden, right out of the gate, one of the first executive orders that he issued was for COVID-19 in the workplace. And I am going to go through what the latest is, at least as of this morning, and this stuff is changing in real time. Uh, but also be mindful that of those initial 40 executive orders, um, many of them dealt with environmental policy, and I know uh, you've been, been uh, talking about that already today as well, um, and workplace uh, uh, employment law. 
Uh, there are going to be more changes there, uh, already have been, uh, just a couple of things on the slide. Um, the independent contractor rule, which is kind of a big deal uh, in the employment and labor arena because it's whether somebody is an employee with full benefits or whether they can be classified as an independent contractor who doesn't get workers' comp, they don't get unemployment insurance, they have to pay their own FICA um, and myriad other benefits. Um, the Trump administration put out a final rule in January, right before the inauguration, and that has been formally rescinded. So now we're back to what had been the uh, policy in 2015, making it more difficult uh, to, to call somebody a contractor. Um, and this has significance in the OSHA and the MSHA arena uh, as well. And, and I do deal with both agencies uh, because uh, imputation of knowledge, for example, to the employer can depend on, on what status the person has. Um, and also uh, even whether someone is your employee can mean the difference between whether you can be cited under the general duty clause or not. So it, it is kind of a big deal in, in ways that might not be readily apparent other than how you're paying them. Um, also, uh, the Trump administration had put out a joint employer rule, uh, which dealt with franchisors, franchisees, but also with various uh, staffing agency uh, and host employer relationships. Um, and it had a residual effect on parent and affiliate uh, relations. Um, again, uh, the Trump uh, rule would have made it more difficult to connect the dots, basically. And for OSHA purposes and MSHA purposes, the corporate size, uh, including all of those permutations, is, is considered when they are looking at the amount of penalty and also the scope of corporate-wide settlement agreements. So Trump rule would have made it more difficult to connect those dots. The U.S. District Court last fall found that that rule was in, invalid. And needless to say, the current Labor Department isn't isn't uh, litigating to preserve that. Uh, also, and I'll close this out kind of on the labor law side of, or employment law side of things, uh, the individual nominated by President Biden to head the wage and hour uh, uh, office, which covers you know everything from overtime pay to child labor laws, uh, is the same. Uh, person who headed it under uh, President Obama. And he also, in the meantime, wrote the book, The Fissured Workplace. So expect that uh, there's going to be a very critical scrutiny of how workers are classified and how they're paid uh, and, and cross referrals. And I had this happen under the previous administration, uh, under the Obama administration. If they find you misclassified something during an OSHA investigation, they will drop a dime on you to main labor, as we say, um, for them to open up a payroll audit. And that is painful. Just trust me on that. Um, now, on the safety and health side of things, which is, of course, why we're here, um, there was were a couple of decisions uh, uh, on uh, as to efforts that the Trump administration had made to uh, basically gut some of the final rules from the Obama administration. And one was the electronic record keeping rule. Uh, the U.S. District Court did uphold uh, the effort that they made to eliminate the need for employers, 250 or more uh, employees at a work site, uh, to have to submit the OSHA 300 and 301 logs electronically. So the law now is you only have to submit the 300A log uh, if you are of that size or if you're in the high hazard industry sector, uh, which uh, presumably most of you are, uh, and you have 20 or more employees. Uh, so again, you have to look at Appendix A, look at the NAICS, the NACE code, uh, for uh, determination of whether you are a reporter if you are a small uh, entity. Uh, beyond that, there was also uh, a modification made by the Trump administration of MSHA's workplace exam rule. And while I know, obviously, this is a maritime association, uh, some of you may fall under MSHA if you are uh, doing things at docks at mine sites, for example. Uh, that, that jurisdiction has been under controversy back and forth uh, over the years. And I think one of them even went to the Supreme Court. So, uh, you know, if you need to know uh, about MSHA, we're not going to talk about it much. Uh, but the workplace exam rule uh, under Obama, which has a lot of detailed paperwork requirements, that is now back in full effect. So beyond that, um, we have a Secretary of Labor now, a former Mayor uh, Walsh from Boston. And uh, Marty Walsh was a laborer. His father was a laborer. 
he said that uh, when he went into the laborers union after his daddy, his daddy said to him, get a suit and tie job with the union because I don't want you to end up like me. And of course, at the confirmation hearing, somebody said, well, what do you mean? And he said, let me tell you, my father retired with 40 percent lung capacity from breathing asbestos, from breathing uh, construction dusts. And so that is a signal that those, you know, occupational health is going to be on the Secretary of Labor's radar screen, uh, which it was not at all <laughs> during during uh, the, the last administration. Beyond that, Cal OSHA uh, chief, uh, Doug Parker, uh, has been nominated by President Biden to be the head of uh, federal OSHA, and he has cleared the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, uh, even got a couple of Republican votes. So I'd say that his confirmation is fairly certain. Uh, they just haven't scheduled it for a Senate vote. Uh, they're a little bit busy uh, with a couple of other things right now. Um, and then nobody has been nominated yet to be the head of MSHA. So uh, in terms of executive branch uh, you know, organization and some of the aftermath of the Trump administration, that's really where we are. So now where are we in 2021 and going forward? Um, first of all, all of the penalties went up as of January 15th of this year. And that happened as a matter of course, uh, because of a, a law from a while ago, indexing uh, these penalties for inflation and uh, according to consumer price index and square root of the hypotenuse, I'm not entirely sure uh, how it came down, but the, the big ones here, the maximum OSHA penalty is now $136,532 per violation. But if you are cited as an egregious violator, then they can issue that per exposed employee. Um, and I just want to tell you, I mean, as somebody who represents employers in OSHA and MSHA matters, it's a sea change. I am seeing penalties already like I hadn't seen since the Obama administration. Uh, I have my first quarter million dollar case uh, that came out just a, a couple of months into this penalties proposed under the new rules. Uh, there is also a mandatory minimum penalty for willful and repeat violations of $9,753. And the uh, serious, other than serious, failure to abate, 13653 Um Now, MSHA, they say to OSHA, you know, hold my beer and watch this. Uh, their maximum penalty is now $274,175. And the maximum for regular assessments, seven, almost $75,000, including personal penalties under Section 110C of the Mine Act. Uh, there's also been, been uh, increases in the failure to report a fatality or any injury resulting uh, that, that could result in death. That's now a mandatory minimum, $6,232. And remember, MSHA, unlike OSHA, only gives you 15 minutes to report a fatal or a serious injury of that type. Uh, they are serious about that. They, they look at when you called, they get your 911 record, and I have had people cited if there was 17 minutes between the two. So if you do fall under MSHA jurisdiction, that, that's you know, an awful high penalty uh, to miss a 15-minute call. Um, also, quick look back, what have been the most cited standards in 2020? Uh, I will say 2020, of course, was an unusual year because of COVID, and yet the top 10 here, exactly the same as in 2019, and I believe in 2018. Before that, uh, two of these, machine guarding at number 10 and the PPE for eye and face protection, they were not on there up until a couple of years ago, but they have come on and they replaced a couple of electrical standards that had previously been among the most cited. So, you know, from my perspective, as somebody, you know, who, who litigates against OSHA, um, you know, we know what they're looking at, you know, get your house in order, basically, because uh, the enforcement is here. Uh, it is definitely uh, stronger than it had been. They are issuing more willful violations. Um, and of course, the repeat violation period is five years now. Um, it had been three years at one point, but it got changed in OSHA's field operations manual a while back. And the, the most willful, the, the uh, primary willful violations are fall protection, confined space. In fact, 
both of those in cases I have right now uh, are among the willful violations. And trenching continues to be uh, obviously one of their hot button topics, along with lockout, tagout, and machine guarding. And again, all of that was in 2020. All of that is consistent with what I'm seeing across a variety of sectors, uh, manufacturing, uh, construction, uh, as as well as uh, you know some of some of the uh, uh, more interesting uh, off oddball industries that I deal with. So uh, pay attention to those, and you should be able uh, to escape you know uh, significant OSHA liability if those are the things uh, that affect people in your workplace. Now, uh, what are we looking at for the new OSHA? Um, first of all, uh, unlike in the previous administration. The unions definitely have the ear of the Secretary of Labor. They are going to have the ear, uh, already do, really, of, of the uh, people who are in OSHA uh, at present. Uh, uh, Jim Frederick, who came from the United Steelworkers um, and, and then more recently had been with the, the National Safety Council, he was in as acting head of OSHA. Uh, but certainly with Doug Parker, uh, Cal OSHA has always been very responsive to the concerns of labor. So what was on the wish list? Uh, from the AFL-CIO. Uh, stepping up enforcement, uh, especially with regard to COVID, getting out an emergency st uh, temporary standard. Well, uh, we will talk about that in a moment, but one did come out. It was in this past Monday's Federal Register, uh, but it is limited in scope to the healthcare sector. Uh, there is new guidance, though, that came out that affects uh, other industries, and we will talk about that in a moment. Um, also, uh, this past December, was OSHA's 50th anniversary, but it kind of went by without a, any kind of cake. There was no party, no candles. Uh, the unions say, let's use this as a springboard for rebuilding and restarting. And, and indeed, already I have heard that theme uh, at some of the, uh, the public discussions uh, that OSHA has made. Um, in terms of regulatory priorities, infectious disease prevention, uh, sneak preview, it is on the spring 2021 regulatory agenda that just came out this month. They did get it out before uh, June 21st, so it was technically a, a spring agenda. Uh, heat exposure, uh, guess again, that is on the spring agenda. Um, and workplace violence rules, yep, that's on the spring agenda too. So all of the things that you know were predicted have come to pass. Uh, another, um, and this is, I think, you know, going to be worthy of more discussion. Um, definitely, they they will need to have some kind of stakeholder uh, initiative on this. Is how to update chemical exposure limits, per permissible exposure limits that are enforceable by OSHA. Um, OSHA right now is very hogtied because their Z tables uh, came largely from 1960s ACGIH threshold limit values. Um, and they have done, obviously, uh, some sector, some uh, substance-specific rulemaking, silica and uh, uh, you know, beryllium and hexavalent chromium being the ones uh, probably of most interest to, uh, to uh, your members here. Uh, but you know, the bottom line is those are arduous processes. NIOSH recommended a recommend exposure limit for silica of 50 micrograms per cubic meter in 1974. And it took OSHA 42 years to respond to that. So clearly, you know, there are thousands of chemicals out there that are, you know, underregulated from the perspective of worker safety or just flat out unregulated because they weren't recognized as a chemical. They, they didn't exist. Um, and so, uh, you know, expect to see some discussion around that, whether it's a push maybe to go to the control banding approach uh, like they do uh, over in Europe uh, or perhaps, you know, a, sm a, a smaller group rulemaking. Uh, than they did back in the, the 1980s that got ultimately thrown out by uh, the court when they tried to update over 400 substances at once. Um, beyond the, those health issues, and really a lot of that is health, um, we are already seeing a reinvigoration of OSHA's uh, federal advisory committees, ACOSH, which is construction, NACOSH, general industry, MACOSH, which is the maritime industry. And uh, they just held a stakeholder meeting on whistleblower protections, but uh, definitely there were recommendations to re reinstitute the whistleblower advisory committee that had been uh, established under President Obama and then was promptly disbanded under the Trump administration. Um, beyond that, uh, in their wish list, the union noted 
that the state OSHAs, the 22 states and the territories that manage their own OSHA plans, have gotten out ahead of federal OSHA. And this has created disparate protections for workers, really depending upon what, what side of a state line they might be standing on. Uh, this is certainly true with regard to COVID, where, for example, Virginia OSHA adopted a permanent standard uh, back in January. They had an emergency standard early last year, and yet the neighboring states of D.C. and Maryland had no comparable protections. Um, and so, you know, that can create, I, I just want to note, liability issues for employers. If you're not managing safety to the most stringent rules that apply in your state, you're doing your workers a disservice. You're, you've already demonstrated the feasibility of heightened protections, but you're not rolling it out across the board. And especially if you have uh, third parties working for you, temporary workers, for example, or subcontractors, that can have a spillover into tort liability, which is going to make those OSHA and MSHA penalties we just talked about really look like small potatoes. So, you know, just be aware of that. Uh, you know, just because you can offer lesser protections doesn't mean you should. And I'm saying that as an, as an industry side attorney. Um, so now let's take a look at where we are and what's coming. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, we already know that COVID was the initial priority, um, and they finally did get that emergency standard out, but limited it to the healthcare sector. Um, there are four states that have OSHA, uh, uh, state OSHA COVID rules, but there's over, you know, I think they're up to a dozen more that have various regulations for workplace safety and COVID going around federal OSHA. And Amazon is now in litigation with New York State uh, over whether OSHA, federal OSHA that is, has exclusive jurisdiction over workplace safety or whether a state can jump in to fill a gap and have it enforced through their health department. So stay tuned because that is going to be a huge issue, especially, you know, God forbid, if we do have a big resurgence due to this, co this uh, Delta variant that is out and, you know, in some cases now is making up 30 plus percent uh, of the cases uh, that are occurring. Uh, you know, there are some pockets I heard uh, just today in Colorado uh, where the ICU in a county that has a very low vaccination rate is the ICU is up to 90 percent capacity now. So, uh, you know, don't assume we're out of the woods on this. Don't assume that all of the rules on COVID that are out there are poised to be rolled back. And I will talk about that a, a, a bit more in a second. Um, beyond that, uh, we're going to be seeing increased use of criminal penalties in this administration. Uh, there had been uh, an initiative back uh, again under the, the uh, Biden, <laughs> the Obama administration, um, where they cross train U.S. attorneys in the Environmental Crimes Unit at the Department of Justice uh, on how to better prosecute OSHA and MSHA violations criminally. Um, they're, they're kind of hamstrung currently, more about that in a moment, because uh, OSHA and MSHA criminal penalties are largely misdemeanors. So what they did when they trained those under this memorandum of understanding was showing uh, the attorneys how to take an OSHA case and bring it under an environmental law, such as the workplace safety uh, provisions of TSCA. Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, or to bring it under 18 U.S. Code uh, for obstruction of justice, witness tampering, conspiracy, those types of things. Um, well, President Trump fired all of those 83 attorneys who had been trained like that, but now new attorneys are being hired by the Biden administration. So expect that that is going to be reinstituted. And for employers, you know, many of whom are you, uh, who who do have environmental uh, considerations uh, at the work sites. Uh, be mindful of the fact that that 2016 revision to TSCA does give EPA uh, some limited jurisdiction over work site safety and health. It's, it's a sleeper. Um, another thing, as I mentioned, is greater use of that egregious penalty power uh, where they can give you a uh, separate citation for each exposed worker. Uh, I will say also, I'm already seeing uh, less willingness to group citations. Uh, one client of mine got cited under the confined space standard, and they issued a separate uh, citation under each subparagraph to where we got, you know, uh, nine citations, uh, each with a maximum penalty. 
Uh, these things can add up in a hurry. Uh, heightened whistleblower protection under both the Mine Act and uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, there is legislation pending already to expand the statute of limitation for whistleblower violations under Section 11C of the OSHA Act to take it from 30 days to 180 days. Um, and OSHA uh, has the power now under the electronic record keeping rule, Section 1904.36, uh, to issue a citation to an employer if they retaliate against a worker for reporting an injury or an illness or engaging in any other protected activity, speaking privately to an inspector, reporting a hazard to OSHA, testifying against the uh, employer. And so what they can do if they find out about that retaliation within 180 days uh, of the retaliatory action, they can cite the employer, fine them up to 136 grand, and then uh, as abatement, require uh, making whole the worker, reinstating them, giving them back pay, restoration of benefits and seniority, et cetera. Um, that is a tool that only took effect uh, with uh, the 2016 electronic record keeping rule, December 1st, 2016. It wasn't used in the Trump administration. It will be used now. And uh, remember uh, also the prior interpretation on drug testing being retaliatory unless it has to, you know, there are carve outs for union contracts, there are carve outs for DOT, uh, but uh, they're going to be back to interpreting it much more strictly, uh, basically requiring there to be reasonable suspicion. You know, that's going to be a big change. And safety incentive programs are, are going to be under renewed scrutiny as well. If you are relying on lagging indicators, you're giving people a gift card for going a year without a lost time injury. OSHA now again views that as retaliatory uh, for reporting an injury, and that could trigger the citation again under 1904.36. So if you haven't revisited your drug testing and your safety incentive programs yet, now is the time to do that. Um, also, in addition to the national emphasis program that OSHA has launched uh, for COVID, expect that there will be change ups on some of the existing ones. Uh, I expect silica to continue. I expect amputations to continue, uh, probably uh, process safety management uh, and health care. Uh, but beyond that, uh, oil, oil and gas refineries, probably that will continue. But there may be some change ups beyond that. And then, as I already said, a continued emphasis on the gig workers. Um, so what is OSHA doing <laughs> this week uh, in, in response to COVID? Uh, this has definitely been enough to give anybody whiplash. Uh, right when they were considering uh, over at Office of Management and Budget how to proceed, having stakeholder meetings on this emergency standard, the CDC kind of threw a hand grenade at OSHA and said, oh, you know, nothing to see here. Uh, you know, you need not wear masks indoors or out if you're vaccinated. Uh, but if you're un unvaccinated, you should wear them indoors, which sounds real casual. Uh, people forget that that is public safety guidance, not binding. It's not binding on, the, on OSHA and it's not binding on the workplace. So if you do fall under one of these state-specific COVID rules, you still are gonna have to comply with that. Um, and federal OSHA similarly has kind of rushed to clarify what it's doing in the guidance that came out on June 10th, largely in response to that CDC hairball uh, that, that uh, got stuck in its throat. Um, one of the big things that I think has been under the radar is that the new OSHA guidance has uh, identified what they're calling at-risk workers. And those are individuals who are fully vaccinated two shots plus 14 days when when they when the government talks about vaccinated that's what they mean not you got one shot of pfizer and or moderna and you decided you didn't want uh, another ouchie so you stopped fully vaccinated is what they're talking about two shots plus 14 days uh for those uh pfizer and moderna one shot for jackson johnson and johnson plus 14 days um and so uh uh, for at-risk workers, you can be fully vaccinated, but if you have one of the health conditions, a uh, heart tr uh, a transplant, heart transplant, lung transplant, liver transplant, kidney transplant, or you have to use steroids, uh, you know, presumably, I guess, if you are using it on your own illegally, 
this would still have the same adverse effect on you. Um, if you have underlying immune disorders, lupus, fibromyalgia, uh, scleroderma, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, they have found that you may not have had a full immune response to the vaccine. And so you're going to have to either be allowed to continue remote working or you uh, are going to have to wear, wear co face covering just like you're unvaccinated, but the people around you may have to wear them as well. Um, I've given you links there to the different guidance uh, that I've been referring to, uh, but the big one is obviously the one that just came out this month, uh, you know, two weeks ago. Um, and again, this has been misconstrued by an awful lot of people. Um, OSHA says, except for workplaces covered by their emergency standard, which is healthcare, or mask requirements for public transportation, which is really under the uh, auspices of DOT or the state uh, DOTs, OSHA says most employers no longer need to take steps to protect workers from COVID-19 in any workplace. People stopped there and went, yay, it's all over. They missed the part after the comma, which is where all employees are fully vaccinated. So if you have anybody in your workplace who is not fully vaccinated, then you do have to take steps. You're right back where we were uh, before the CDC said all the all in free. And so if you have any unvaccinated or at risk workers in your workplace, the next, these 11 uh, criteria of guidance apply to you. Um, now, some of these admittedly are a bit outside of OSHA's wheelhouse, giving paid time off for workers to get vaccinated. Now, sorry, they don't have a, a, a way to enforce that. You know, that's, that's employment and labor law. Um, telling people to stay home though, if they've had contact with infected people, or themselves are infected. Um, continuing the physical distancing uh, for unvaxed, uh, vaccinated or at-risk workers, again, fully vaccinated, but with an underlying health condition in all communal work areas, break rooms, locker rooms, and you know, bathrooms, office space, you know, uh, you know, if you have a cubicle farm in an administrative uh, office, for example, uh, you're gonna have to continue that just like you've been doing. Um, protecting unvaccinated or at-risk workers with the good old face coverings or surgical masks, unless they have to wear a more protective respirator or other PPE. So if you're wearing an N95, you don't have to slap a face covering on top of that. Um, also, if you have visitors to your work site, customers, guests, make sure they wear face coverings because you are not gonna be able to ascertain their vaccination status. For, for interior, uh, uh, workplaces, uh, maintaining your ventilation systems. And again, that is a little bit more complicated than some people make it out to be uh, because you have to, uh, they've incorporated by reference the ASHRAE uh, specifications, uh, MERV 13 or above, cleaning your ductwork, you know, cleaning your filters, cleaning the, you know, the vent, all of the, uh, the other ancillary parts of your ventilation system. Um, beyond that, uh, they suggest implementing an anonymous process for workers to submit complaints about COVID concerns so that they are free from retaliation. Um, and then they remind you that OSHA can still get you for the PPE uh, components that, are, that you're subject to. Respiratory protection, sanitation. Uh, well, of course, the porta potties do apply generally. For COVID, they're talking about hand washing stations, uh, potable water, uh, or hand sanitizer if you have a portable uh, uh, workplace where, where that is impossible. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Bloodborne pathogens, to the extent that that applies to you. Um, and then remember, you know, your exposure uh, and medical records, things like uh, medical evaluation, sampling, you have to keep those typically period of employment plus 30 years. Um, unless the worker has been employed for less than a year, and then you can let them port their records with them. Um, so there's a lot in there. Um, OSHA also issued an enforcement memorandum, um, which is inward facing. Uh, it was to instruct the inspectors, the area directors, regional administrators on what to do. And basically they said, perform on-site inspections, look for COVID hazards, look for appropriate controls. Remember that you've got the general duty clause out there you can use. Also, they are allowing them, 
uh, including in, in complaint inspections and even in the follow up to, to uh, injury to do these uh, by phone or video interviewing people that way rather than face to face um, and asking for documents electronically. Um, beyond that, if a, if a compliance officer believes they've been exposed, they have to notify their area director. And presumably, if that person had been at, at work sites during their contagious period, those employers uh, would be notified. So uh, be aware, you know, that's always a possibility. Um, they will prioritize the unprogrammed COVID inspections. Unprogrammed, remember, are those that originate from uh, fatality or hospitalization reports. Uh, hazard complaints from uh, current workers, um, they do prioritize those. Uh, they know that disgruntled former workers uh, may just file bogus complaints. So uh, for priority, they go. They want to know if you're a current employee. Um, and also, um, if they get uh, professional referrals, uh, you know, from, from other agencies, for example, uh, that they observe that there are OSHA violations. Um, and uh, whistleblower complaints would be the other COVID-related uh, unprogrammed inspections. I'm handling a couple of those already. They are definitely following them much more seriously uh, than they were for the last four years. Um, and then programmed inspections, the COVID national emphasis inspections would take priority, but they are still carrying out inspections under the other national emphasis programs. And in targeting uh, their resources, they're going to be looking at the uh, community transmission. They're going to be looking at uh, mitigation such as vaccination rates, uh, the industry and their ability to wear face coverings or PPE, um, and the need to work within close contact. With They are still saying six feet for a total of 15 minutes in a 24-hour period. It's not three feet. You know, everybody is kind of taking pieces from uh, the, what they like out of the CDC guidance and pretending that that's what OSHA uh, is OK with. But it's not what OSHA is OK with. So, you know, be cognizant of the current uh, guidance that's out there. Um, the National Emphasis Program, there is a lot to that. Please read it. Um, also look and see uh, what the NACE codes are uh, that are covered by this. But it is a one-year targeted program looking at high hazard industries. Where have they had clusters for the, you know, during 2020? That's going to be a pretty good guidepost. Um, they're going to be going back and re-inspecting some of the workplaces that they visited in 2020 uh, to see if they have maintained the abatement uh, uh, measures that they adopted relative to COVID. And if they haven't, that can be a willful violation. Um, this uh, national emphasis program may be amended. It could be canceled. It could, you know, it could be ended uh, sooner rather than a year if COVID becomes a nothing. But right now, it's not a nothing, and you know, unfortunately, the rates are going back up in in some states. Um, also, they issued the first general duty clause citation under this national emphasis program. They did classify it as a willful. Uh, at the maximum penalty of 136 grand, and it was against a tax preparation company, uh, you know, who who wasn't maintaining uh, uh, sanitation. Uh, they weren't maintaining bar barriers uh, between workers and social distancing and face masks. So, you know, that's an awful lot of money to pay for not wearing a face mask. Um, the goal of this, obviously, is to to reduce COVID cases, but one of the uh, interesting components of this, which is unusual for a national emphasis program, is that it has a whistleblower component. And so when the compliance safety and health officers, that's the code for inspectors, when they come out, they are going to be uh, distributing educational information to the workers about their rights under Section 11C and also, again, under Part 1904, which are the injury and illness uh, reporting requirements, and they include the whistleblower protections that deal with drug testing incentive programs uh, and the right uh, to all of these other uh, protected activities that I've been mentioning. Um, beyond that, uh, if you are already on OSHA's site-specific targeting program, which means you're in a high hazard industry NACE code, and then the electronic data that you submitted online to them shows that you have an elevated DART rate compared to others in your NACE code, you're on that site-specific targeting list. But, you know, it's a big list, and it's the lowest inspection priority. So normally, they don't get to everybody. But here's the kicker. If they come in under the uh, COVID National Emphasis Program or any other one, such as silica, 
they will concurrently do a site-specific targeting wall-to-wall -wall inspection with a record audit. Uh, whereas normally a national emphasis program is limited in scope to uh, the areas, the equipment that are, are covered by it, sandblasting or machine guarding. Um, and so, you know, they will tear you a new one uh, and they will be able to look at your logs, you know, going back five years. Now, currently they can only cite you uh, for, for errors uh, in record keeping or omissions going back 180 days. Uh, but be aware that there, and, and I have this in some other slides, but uh, while I'm talking about it, uh, if that legislation passes, uh, then OSHA already has on their agenda reinstating the continuing violation rule, which means that they can cite you for errors and omissions in your OSHA logs uh, or records going back the full amount of time that you have to maintain the record uh, under the codified standard. Uh, that'll be a huge change. Um, also, uh, the uh, COVID relief bill that President Biden signed into law uh, this spring gave OSHA an additional $100 million in funding uh, to use for enforcement between now and September 30th, 2021. Um, only $5 million of that is earmarked for COVID. So they have some autonomy in how they apply the rest of it. And then looking forward, uh, the Biden administration budget for 2022 which starts October 1st of 2021, uh, would give OSHA and the Department of Labor about a 17% increase. Um, and on the OSHA side, it specifically calls for hiring a lot more inspectors uh, and also a lot of this money being earmarked both for rulemaking activity and also for enforcement. Um, and, and this basically, uh, you know, I think, uh, speaks for itself. Uh, if you want to know more about the NEP, uh, you can look up the document. But in the interest of time, we have still have a bit more to cover here. So uh, I also wanted to mention MSHA has new guidance out for COVID as well. It largely parallels uh, OSHA, but uh, for, for those who work in the mining industry, especially underground, there are some unique requirements, uh, including ventilation uh, enhancement. But the state plan rulemakings, um, you know, be mindful that they do conflict with the CDC guidance and the state plan uh, rules are enforceable, whereas the CDC guidance is not. Virginia did a final rule, permanent rule, uh, came out in January. Uh, now they're kind of considering where things are going to go. California had an aerosol transmissible disease rule limited to the healthcare side of things. Then they adopted an emergency temporary standard that was industry wide. Um, and then they started considering revisions uh, uh, to this and modifications. And literally last Thursday night, a week ago, uh, they voted not to approve the rescissions. So that kind of leaves things a little bit uh, in flux right now in California. Uh, Oregon OSHA adopted permanent COVID rules uh, just last month in May. And now they said, Oop, you know, maybe with the CDC, uh, we're really not sure. So their standards board uh, is going to meet bi-monthly starting next month to determine whether to modify or repeal uh, those standards. And, and uh, uh, the governor also said uh, just uh, as of uh, about a week ago that uh, if Oregon gets to 70 percent fully vaxxed, then they will abolish mask, mask requirements entirely. And uh, also Oregon OSHA or OSHA will rescind the rule at that time. So that's an aspirational goal, but it's got to be 70% fully vaxxed. Um, My OSHA, Michigan, uh, they also adopted a COVID emergency standard uh, in October. That was set to expire at the end of May. And then the governor uh, made some pronouncements about it uh, uh, right at that point. Um, Washington State, all, all the shores and, and ports, right? Uh, Washington State OSHA just uh, indicated their intent to propose an infectious disease prevention rule, which would encompass COVID-19. And there are going to be public hearings and stakeholder uh, opportunities on that. Uh, even in Maryland, uh, they just, the legislature uh, just adopted a law. Um, it took effect this month without Governor Hogan's signature to require Maryland OSHA to adopt a COVID-19 rule comparable to Virginia or to federal OSHA. And then Nevada, 
Uh, well, that's more landlocked. Uh, they just issued a new COVID policy last month, too. Um, so there's a lot going on in that area. If you are a multi-state employer, make sure that, again, you are keeping an eye on the changes. Uh, you can't just rely on what's being uh, uh, coming out of federal OSHA in order to be in full compliance. Um, so what is on federal OSHA's uh, spring agenda? Um, well, first of all, uh, process safety management uh, is new on the pre-rule stage. Uh, emergency response, uh, they're going to do a small business uh, impact panel on that uh, at some point in the future. Uh, they're going to be making changes to their mechanical power press rules. Workplace violence prevention. Right now, uh, that is limited to health care and social services, but they have to do a small business impact panel on that, which is scheduled to start in December. They could broaden the scope of that rule. And, and especially if we continue to have workplace shootings, uh, you know, affecting retail stores, restaurants, you know, transit uh, authorities, uh, churches, you know, these, these are all people's workplaces. And uh, I could easily see this administration broadening this to encompass all industry. So that's, that's another one to keep an eye on. Um, they also are looking, and this is important for you folks, they are looking to raise the blood lead level at which workers would be removed to make it more protective. So they're going to do an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on that. Um, heat stress prevention. Uh, they're going to have a request for information out in October. And that is on there because OSHA, uh, just in the last couple of years, lost two big cases where they had cited employers under the general duty clause. And in fact, uh, in one of them, the court said that OSHA could not rely on the National Weather Service heat index to impute knowledge to the employer because it wasn't really a scientific thing. It was more you know, kind of a, 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 a pain point uh, uh, approach to things. And so that kind of put them back to the drawing board. Uh, but clearly heat stress does kill people. Um, and so uh, this is going to be moving. And, and there is legislation pending to require OSHA to do a rule as well on both heat stress and workplace violence. But obviously, because they have them on their agenda, that probably won't be a priority uh, for the House of Representatives or the Senate to move. Uh, over on the proposed rule stage, there's a lot on there. And, you know, I could talk a blue streak on all of these. I was told, by the way, that, that I can go past the bottom of the hour because we started late. So please do hang in there with me. Uh, but the things you want to watch out for, that continuing violation rule, uh, Crane and Derek, yeah, they're still screwing around with that rule. Shipyard fall protection as well, with a notice of proposed rulemaking coming out in December. Uh, communication tower safety, also at the proposed rule stage for uh, March of next year. Uh, they are in the process of making changes to the hazard communication standard. Uh, the comment period closed on that already, but a public hearing is scheduled. Uh, WebEx, so you can participate wherever you are uh, for September 21st, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, you have to register for that in advance, I believe, if you do want to testify. Um, and uh, lockout tagout, uh, that is on there for a proposed rule next January. And my understanding is it's not a wholesale rewrite of the rule, but rather narrowly focused uh, to allow for certain computerized or laser, uh, you know, technology-based guarding. Um, however, that was put on the agenda under the Trump administration. The scope of it could clearly be broadened, uh, you know, depending upon the comments that they get. Uh, also, tree care, uh, that's probably not a big one for you all, uh, but revision to the silica rule. Um, on the construction side, they are looking to reopen that, probably to add additional tasks under table one, which would exempt you from having to do any of the periodic sampling. Um, also, the court had ordered OSHA to reconsider whether there should be a medical removal provision. So watch for that coming. Uh, but you know, one of the sleeper provisions, uh, when they were reopening this and they did an RFI, Request for Information, under the Trump administration, uh, it was with the idea of allowing general industry and maritime to use table one, two, uh, not just construction. And I think that would have been a slam dunk uh, had they gotten that rulemaking done last year, but they didn't. And so what's on the agenda only talks about construction for the table one amendments, 
and then medical removal would be general industry, maritime, and construction. So keep an eye on that. Also welding and construction, uh, uh, some changes there, and a modification uh, of the general industry walking working surfaces rule. That is already underway. Uh, it was in the uh, May 20th Federal Register this year, but it's very narrow uh, modification to clarify some stair and, and railing requirements. So that's basically what they've got proposed. And then at the final rule stage, there's not much. Uh, COVID ETS, they already uh, put that out. Uh, and on the MSHA side, though, uh, Crystal and Silica is on their agenda to bring their rule into alignment with federal OSHA. And then uh, next month, a proposed rule is expected on surface uh, haulage, surface mo mobile equipment. Um, and again, those of you who maybe work at uh, loading areas of mines, um, if you're using equipment that would fall under this, uh, you would be covered by it. And the reason that's the thing that's driving this is the last several years, powered haulage accidents have been responsible for 50 percent of mining fatalities. And that includes cement plants, stone quarries, sand and gravel operations, dredging operations, et cetera. Uh, so it's not just your gold and silver and coal mines. Uh, it does encompass a lot more under MSHA jurisdiction. Um, I mentioned before that OSHA is in the midst of this HASCOM rulemaking. And be aware of what's going on here. Um, they are changing the 2012 rule to come into alignment with the seventh revision to the uh, UN's global harmonization system. And the idea, that's a good one, I mean, we, we do need to do this, is to bring us also into alignment with Canada and some of our US trading partners and to finally synchronize somehow what DOT, the EPA, and OSHA are doing relative to hazard communication, you know, labeling, placarding, and everything else. Um, so this looked like it was going to be easy peasy, you know, lemon squeezy kind of thing, except it has become hugely controversial because uh, the way that they uh, I, I reopened this, it poses new burdens on, on uh, those who are uh, manufacturing chemicals, some of the intermediaries uh, to uh, analyze things. And uh, uh, just trust me on this, it is a big deal. If people want a lot more detail on this, contact me after this and I'll be happy to share information. So as I mentioned, the public hearing, September 21st, I've given you the link there if you want more information and the docket number. So you can read the comments that have already been submitted um, and then decide if you do need to or want to uh, testify uh, at this uh, hearing that'll be coming up. Um, the site-specific targeting program, I've already explained that really. And the only change in that, because this took effect uh, in 2018, uh, the Biden administration still has this unchanged uh, from the Trump administration so far. Uh, but in December, kind of on their way out the door, they added that instead of just looking at a one-year elevation in uh, the employer's DART rate to put them on the list, the inspector could look at the three-year trend. And if it wasn't uh, increased over the uh, industry NACE code DART rate for three years, then the inspector had discretion not to uh, proceed with the wall-to-wall -wall inspection. Uh, but you know, beyond that, that that part of the guidance may well be changed uh, once we have a new uh, uh, chief at OSHA, uh, which you know could be by before the end of this month. Uh, probably not though, because I, I think they're uh, Senate's on their way out the door for uh, the Fourth of July recess. But probably in July, uh, Doug Parker uh, will be confirmed. Um, beyond that, uh, taking a look over at Congress, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the appropriations bump. Uh, will continue uh, for 2022, assuming that that legislation gets approved. Now, the Department of Labor uh, has been uh, funded under continuing resolutions for, I think, the last 118 administrations. And I'm joking on that, but it has been years since we have had both the House and the Senate enact a labor HHS appropriations bill. So, you know, I, I don't expect things to be any better in this Congress, but um, even continuing under the current funding levels, that's a lot of money for OSHA. Now, there were bills, um, again, aspirational bills that had been introduced by the Democrats last time around in Congress, but now they have control of both chambers. And several of those I'm going to talk about because they've been reintroduced. Uh, another little sleeper thing out there, 
is a group called the Center for Progressive Reform, which drafted legislation to create a private right of action for workers who identify, you know, problems, violations in the workplace, and OSHA can't get to them because with the current staffing, OSHA can get to every workplace once every 162 years, seriously. Um, so this would allow them to go to court uh, and sue if they were exposed to hazards. Um, and they would be entitled to attorney's fees if they win. Um, also, uh, that, that would eliminate what I'm talking, I was talking about earlier in that Amazon uh, uh, versus New York case, uh, which is seeking to declare that OSHA has exclusive jurisdiction. This would obviate that. Um, also, they're recommending a bounty system. So if a, uh, an employee complains about a safety hazard to OSHA, if OSHA comes out, investigates it, issues a citation and it's upheld, then the worker who reported the, the hazard would get 30% of the penalty. And you know, 30% of 136 grand is a chunk of change. Um, and 70% of it would go to OSHA rather than going to the US Treasury. So again, you know, is there any way in, in uh, HE double hockey sticks that this is gonna get through? Uh, not unless, you know, maybe the filibuster goes away, then it could. Uh, but I, the, the OSHA reform legislation has been framed out already. It was introduced on Worker Memorial Day, which was April 28th, and that is uh, the, the Protecting America's Workers Act. This is kind of a, an evergreen bill, but again, they haven't had, uh, the Democrats have not had control of the House and the Senate for quite a while to be able to even think about passing this. Um, and interestingly, the last time I checked, which was uh, a few days ago, the text of this had not yet been published in the congressional record. So I think they are tweaking it because there were probably some things in there about COVID uh, you know, that, that are no longer necessary because the emergency standard came out. Um, but there's a lot in here. It would take criminal penalties from six months for willfully killing a worker uh, through a, a violation to it being a knowing violation uh, that is connected with the death or serious bodily injury of a worker. So that would be a new area. And it would take it from six months in the federal pen to 10 years. And a knowing violation is what the EPA uses. It's a lesser level of uh, you know, ren mens rea, as we say in the legal trade, than a willful violation. Um, so that's a big deal. It came in with 20 uh, co-sponsors. Um, it also would require immediate abatement of violations unless you filed a motion uh, uh, to stay abatement. Even if you filed a notice of contest, we're currently just filing a contest is enough to stop the clock on abatement. It would require OSHA to investigate all fatalities and serious injuries. Currently, they only investigate about 40% of amputations and 25% of hospitalizations. So that would be a big change. Um, it also would give OSHA per permission uh, to go ahead with uh, reinstating the continuing violation rule, which had been rescinded by uh, the Red Congress in 2017. It would do a kind of one-time update of consensus standards that had been rendered obsolete but which were incorporated by reference into existing OSHA rules. Um, and it would expand coverage of federal OSHA to public sector workers uh, in those states. Uh, currently, state plan OSHAs, uh, you know, like Cal OSHA or Oregon OSHA, they have to cover public sector workers. But uh, uh, federal OSHA, there is no coverage other than four states, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Illinois, which adopted through the state legislatures protections for federal for uh, their public sector workers and those are enforced again through the state health departments uh, not through federal OSHA uh, and then finally this is where the whistleblower protection would be taken from 30 days to 180 days now the whistleblower provisions the criminal uh, uh, penalties those are going to be walked through as separate pieces of legislation in addition to being part of this omnibus 70 plus page uh, piece of legislation that is never going to go anywhere. Um, and uh, indeed, a, a couple of them, as I mentioned, the, the records, those have been introduced already. Um, the heat stress, uh, the workplace violence. Uh, there is also bipartisan legislation to require MSHA 
to do an emergency standard. Um, and that uh, was introduced by Shelley Moore Capito, a Republican from West Virginia, uh, along with Joe Manchin, who's been in the news lately. Um, so watch out for that uh, if you do work at mines. Uh, the reason compelling that is, A, we've had uh, breakouts at mines. B, miners, uh, especially those who have uh, co-worker pneumoconiosis uh, or who have uh, compromised lungs from silica, they are at higher risk of, co of developing serious complications from COVID, including long COVID. Um, and the other is that MSHA doesn't have a general duty clause, so they're a little bit toothless in terms of what they can enforce relative to COVID. Um, beyond that, uh, there's also legislation uh, to codify the Voluntary Protection Program so that it could not be abolished, uh, you know, from administration to administration. Uh, you know, I don't think that's a real big priority right now, but it could go through. And then finally, I was asked just to very quickly give an update on medical cannabis. Um, at present, 37 states plus D.C. and all of the U.S. territories have legalized medical cannabis. Uh, 17 states plus D.C., Guam and uh, Mauritides Islands, uh, they now have legalized recreational uh, marijuana. Connecticut is considering it right now. Delaware is considering it right now. Um, there's a bunch of states that decriminalized use. Um, and the latest uh, states that have uh, come on board legal are New Mexico, New York, and Virginia. Um, and uh, again, under the radar, in the recreational Virginia cannabis legislation, they added new protections for medical cannabis patients in that state. Um, you cannot basically fire somebody uh, for testing positive for medical cannabis. And in terms of defense contractors, um, you can refuse to hire somebody who tests positive, but only if their test level is 50 nanograms, five zero or above. So if you are refusing to hire somebody for testing positive at 20, uh, you're not going to be able to do that in Virginia anymore. Um, now, DOT, again, pure life form there, continue to do what DOT says. Um, beyond that, just bear in mind that uh, the Biden administration made legalization of cannabis one of their campaign platforms. And there are a lot of bills pending before Congress right now, bipartisan bills, uh, to accomplish that. Um, you know, it's, in some cases, they're linked to the restorative ju justice initiatives. In some cases, they're part of tax bills, which can pass with 50 votes, uh, generally. Um, they've already uh, passed in the House legislation to allow commercial banking and credit cards to be used at dispensaries. Um, and uh, again, a big one is the veterans bill, uh, because if the VA is authorized to dispense medical cannabis, you know, how many veterans are, are working for you all at the shipyards, uh, at, you know, or stevedores? Um, it's going to be very difficult even for construction companies to adopt a policy. We don't hire veterans, you know, that use cannabis. Um, it's being recommended by workers' comp uh, providers now, doctors, in lieu of opiates because of the crushing issues we have about addiction, um, you know, and suicide and mental health issues. Um, so um, if it is legalized at the federal level, that negates all of that case law under the ADA that says currently you don't have to accommodate the use of medical cannabis the way you would say uh, prescribed opiates. Uh, that is gonna be a game changer. Um, and in terms of workers comp, there's already uh, 16 states that have considered whether employers have to reimburse workers for medical cannabis. 12 out of the 16 said yes. And in New Jersey, which was one of those states, um, the employer in m &K Construction uh, sued and said, well, we, we can't be forced to do this because uh, it will force us to violate the Federal Controlled Substances Act. And the court said, no, uh, you're not possessing it. You're not dealing it. You're simply reimbursing uh, the cost of it to a legal patient. Um, and so you don't have that defense available. There were similar rulings in Maine and New Hampshire, um, rulings in Pennsylvania that had been predicated on this illegality under the Federal Controlled Substances Act. Those are impacted by this as well. So as it stands now, the uh, 12 states that have held that employers do have to reimburse workers for medical cannabis are Arizona, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maine, Minnesota, all the news, the New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, and New York, Rhode Island, and Vermont. And the only states that said you do not have to reimburse uh, cannabis 
is Florida, Massachusetts, Michigan, and North Dakota. So uh, that concludes what I have. Boy, look at that. I came within one minute of my hour. Um, I, I'm happy to open it up and respond to any questions that might be out there. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you very much. I think it took two breaths. I think it took two breaths. <laughs> <laughs> I want some soda. Yeah, I did. I see. I did see you cheat with the soda. That was very. That was very nice. <laughs> we have one. I have one question here. Um, about let's see. Here it goes. Any advice for operating in states such as Florida that pass laws forbidding asking for proof of vaccinations? Boy, that is a tough spot for employers to be in, because frankly, uh, you know, OSHA says. If you want to treat the workplace um, as one where you don't have to have masks and distancing and partitions, you have to have a fully vaccinated workforce. OSHA's guidance says you can ask for proof of vaccination. Uh, the EEOC says you can require your employees to be vaccinated. Um, so Florida is clearly butting heads with the feds on that level. Um, for an employer, who opts to abide by the Florida rule or other states as well, um, you know, that might say we're not going to allow employers in our state to verify vaccination status. The only option you have is to act as if your entire workforce is unvaccinated. And in that case, you're going to have to require everybody to wear a mask. Uh, you're going to have to require everybody to continue distancing uh, and so on and so on and scooby dooby doo uh, until such time as uh, federal OSHA uh, changes their tune. Um, if you are in one of the state programs, uh, you know, you mentioned Florida, um, you know, they are federal OSHA, obviously. Uh, but if you are in a state, uh, planned state, where the state legislature has you know, intervened in the employment law arena in a similar regard, you're going to have to look at your state OSHA uh, website and see if they have uh, issued any clarification. Um, but I will tell you, you're not going to get cited for going beyond minimum protections. So if you make everybody wear a face mask because you have to assume they are all either at risk, um, as, as I defined it earlier, or are unvaccinated, um, at least from the OSHA perspective, you're not going to get cited. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're on the side of employers and not the side of OSHA. We got a chance. So. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the uh, group? With that, I thank you very much for the time. A very good presentation. Uh, got a couple of comments here that they really enjoyed it. A lot of information provided. Um, thank you very much. Thank I, I'll you. Turn it over. Okay, with that said, I'll turn it over to Rob. Thanks, Joe, and and thanks, Adele. That that was uh, uh that was a rip roaring. Uh, that was probably an eight hour seminar in one hour <laughs> thrown out at us with that. Uh, so much good information, and uh, and we appreciate your uh, your taking the taking the time to be with us. Very very interesting. Um, Thank you. I did have another question, but it's going to take okay. too long to to answer. So I will contact you on the outside. Um, yeah, if there's no more uh, no more questions, we'll start to bring it to a close. Uh, again, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors uh, who who have helped support NIMSA through this process, uh, DuPont Sustainable Solutions, <clears throat> the Pacific Maritime Association, uh, Starcrest Consulting Group, uh, USMX, and uh, of course, uh, WCS, World Crane Services, um, had a presentation this, uh, earlier, and uh, and Red Wing Shoes, our, our, uh, our good friends at Red Wing Shoes. So we thank you so much for your support to us. Um, finally, thank you so much to the attendees for uh, coming to this, I hope you gained a lot of knowledge uh, about our industry and and the uh, the safety issues we face, and maybe some good solutions for you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future NIMSA meetings, uh, and and hopefully at our annual meeting next year in Miami. Um, thanks again for attending. And if there's nothing further, this concludes our uh, our program, our annual meeting for 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Good Rob, well, thank you, man. Rob, Great job. Great job. Uh, thank thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks, everyone. Everyone. Be safe. Thank you very much. Great job. Great job. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob.